and uh, I have been asked to speak to you about something that's a little difficult um, because I write, so I write a lot, if you've read Current Affairs magazine, I, I write a lot about socialist values and socialist ideas, what we stand for, and, and the Current Affairs is dedicated to trying to articulate the arguments for leftism and uh, try to persuade people. I mean, I've just written this book called Why You Should Be a Socialist, and the whole thing is basically the case for why we're right, um, and why the democratic socialist way of looking at the world um, is the best way to look at the world, why people should all agree with us and then come and join us. Um, so I'm used to spending my time showing that socialism gives you a very clear understanding of how society works and a compelling vision for how things ought to be. But because the people in this room uh, share already that understanding and that vision and do not need to be told that you are right because you already know, um, today I've been asked to help us think about the difficult question, which is the next step. Once you believe in socialist values, what does it mean to be a socialist? What do you do with those beliefs? What does socialism mean for us, each person, in practice. When we ask that question, uh, what does it mean to be a socialist, we might typically answer with, well, describing our socialist convictions, but that really doesn't answer the question of what do you do? Each of us in this room is a person moving through the world. We're not just an abstract set of ideas floating in space, and so we have to figure out how to behave, how to actualize our politics, how to put these socialist ideals into action, and that part is much, much, much harder than the part where you become convinced that leftist politics is intellectually or morally sound. It's harder than the thing I have to do uh, every day, which is just to uh, you know, have opinions. Uh, proving that socialism is a good idea is the easy bit. Building a more socialist society, uh, knowing what what on earth each of us is supposed to do in order to make it work, that is the nearly impossible task that we have committed ourselves to, that you have committed yourselves to. So, um, in many ways, think about uh, the historic tensions on the left, in, uh, the intra-left conflicts. A lot of those have come about precisely because this question of what is to be done is such a hard one. I mean, those who have marched under the banner of socialism, they've all shared a common aspiration toward a society without class divisions where exploitation disappears, people relate to one another on the basis of equality and a spirit of comradeship, and where the world is not owned and operated for the benefit of a few. But we've been torn apart over what we ought to do to bring it about. The revolutionary socialists have been skeptical of what can be accomplished through the existing political system and predicted that whatever small gains you might make will soon be wiped out, while the more sort of reformist and Fabian socialists have felt the achievement of socialist ends is destined to be gradual. Uh, there's the sort of anarchist Marxist divide, uh, more decentralist tendencies of socialism, which believe that centralized state power inevitably produces authoritarianism and prevents democracy. And then there's sort of been the more centralizing uh, tendencies that believe that you can't get anything done unless you're willing to take and wield power. And the DSA, because it is a big tent organization that welcomes socialists of all stripes, often sees debates of this kind. And, you know, what, what are the reasons that the antagonism between different kinds of uh, socialists, between factions, has been so fierce, is because all of them are right. Uh, those who think that if you get into government, you will probably become co-opted and accomplish little, um, they have good reason for thinking that. They have a lot of examples that prove their point. Um, those who believe that armed revolution uh, would be destined to end in bloodshed and chaos, uh, they also have plenty of history that they can point to. And so what the DSA is trying to do now is somehow take many seemingly irreconcilable viewpoints and resolve them, incorporating the best parts of every different socialist tendency. And what the people in this organization have realized is that if we don't figure out a way of bringing everyone together, of healing factional rifts within the socialist movement, we are guaranteed to fail. And with a planetary emergency facing us, we can't afford to fail. Um, 
I think everybody in this organization knows that. I mean, I was in Atlanta uh, last summer for the, for the GSA convention, and it was an incredibly uh, powerful and inspiring experience. It was contentious. There was a lot of debate, and many people were frustrated by different things that happened there. But on the whole, it did feel like there was more unity than we have seen on the left in a very long time. There was a real sense of common purpose, of true solidarity, being in this together, no matter what our differences are. There are always going to be arguments, uh, very, very difficult ones. Um, but the question is whether we can let these arguments uh, destroy our movement. And I, I, I came out of uh, Atlanta really feeling strongly like they weren't going to. Um, so lesson one for how we do socialism together is we have to get along because so many leftists throughout history have ended up divided against one another. Uh, personally, I, I try and avoid getting into truly bitter disputes with uh, fellow leftists. Uh, you know, Jacobin is kind of a rival magazine to current affairs, but we love them and they love us. We have friendly relations because um, all we have is each other uh, in, in this world, and, and we are still marginal. Um, I don't think we will be for long, but we are technically. And um, the DSA has already made incredible steps towards showing that you can have a functional and quite powerful left organization that can incorporate everyone from anarchists to hardcore Leninists to social democrats and that is allowing different groups to pursue different strategies in different places. Um, so considering that you are trying to do the impossible, uh, which is to achieve unity without compromise, you are doing a pretty good job of it. Um, so, but we have to, if we try to do more than just get everyone in rooms together agreeing that socialism is good. We are then trying to make real political change that consists of more than the word change printed on a poster. Um, and after so long of being shut out of the political system, of having the left be completely on the fringes in this country, now that people are starting to come around and appreciate our ideas, and think of us as serious, we have to act quickly and seize the opportunity. Um, it is worth reflecting on just how critical and unique our current political moment is. Uh, for most of my life, uh, if you were on the left, uh, it meant that you were destined to lose. Being on the left meant failing over and over and over again. Uh, in fact, for most of history, being a leftist has been getting used to failing over and over again. Bernie Sanders spent several decades in Congress, uh, basically alone, speaking to an empty house floor and being a lonely dissident. It was until he was a very old man that people started to listen to him, started to think that maybe he'd been right all of those years. So when we look back at those who came before us on the left, uh, the people from throughout history whose torch we proudly carry, we see thousands and thousands of incredibly committed individuals, people who struggled and often died trying to create a better world. They were repressed violently. In fact, uh, as difficult as what we have to do is, uh, it, it really is nothing compared to what those in previous generations have often faced. Labor organizers have been murdered, they've been shot down on picket lines. The anti-war protesters at Kent State were gunned down by the National Guard. The heroes of the civil rights movement and anti-racism struggles, uh, Martin Luther King and Fred Hampton, both socialists, were assassinated. They gave their lives to make the path easier for us. And so many of these people who gave so much remain still anonymous to us. They are workers who fought their bosses, women who took to the street to demand the vote, LGBT people who took on the police at Stonewall, prisoners who have staged strikes that never get talked about or covered. Right now, the people of Iraq are out in the streets of Baghdad demanding an end to the US occupation. Their fight isn't really in the news. You're not going to be told of their names, but they are people who, like so many others, are daring to take on the powerful. So I think a second point beyond trying to achieve unity that we need to remember as we figure out what to do as socialists is to understand the context in which we exist, to read about the socialists who came before us. How did they navigate the situations they found themselves in? What did they do that succeeded? What did they do that failed? Uh, why? Which of their defeats were the inevitable result of being crushed by a power larger than them? And where were their strategic choices that could have been made differently? Because 
there have been important leftist victories. In the early 1900s, socialists held a thousand elected offices around this country. They had socialist mayors, they had socialists in state legislatures, and they did, in fact, get things done. They passed legislation. In fact, uh, often uh, what would happen then is that the socialists would propose something, and then the other parties would, uh, it would become hugely popular, and the other parties would have to adopt it. And then the socialists didn't sound uh, radical anymore because their entire agenda had been, uh, been co-opted. That's sort of what's happening uh, now, in a way, too. Um, the people who came before us, they, they won. They won us the right to weekends, eight-hour days, child labor laws, workplace safety legislation, and uh, that was not easy. And many of the things that they did gain, like unions, like pensions, have been taken away since. Um, in fact, I mean, like I say, they won the eight-hour day and the weekend. We don't have the eight-hour day and the weekend. Actually, we say we have the eight-hour day and the weekend, but so many people work far more than eight-hour days. So many, so many people don't get weekends. Um, and we won't actually have those things or be able to say that we have those things until every single person in the world has them, which obviously they don't. So, unfortunately, the socialists, the vibrant socialist movement of the early 1900s was crushed. Uh, world War I was a big part of it because war fever can really make a nation lose its marbles and Americans were told to hate Germans instead of the owning class. Um, we can't let that happen this time around. The stakes are too high. This time, we need to win. So, the third point I'd make about being a socialist is we have to think strategically. So as you grapple with these questions, how to be, how to act, one of the most important things you can start doing is analyzing the world in terms of not just who has the power, because we know who has the power, but how they retain it and what it would take to change it. Um, a friend of mine is a labor organizer who um, worked on the successful campaign to unionize the dining hall workers at Pomona College. And he told me that the way they thought about what they were going to do is the administration doesn't want a union, but there are other things that the administration doesn't want to. They don't want to have their board meetings disrupted. Uh, they don't want the students to be in open revolt against them. They don't want parents calling them. They don't want to have people banging pots and pans outside the president's house at 3 in the morning. So, how do we make it so that their desire not to have a union is overridden by their other desires? And that's uh, what they did. They made life hell for the administration until they gave in. That's what you have to do. You have to say, how do we get in the way of what powerful people want? Uh, so here's another example of strategic thinking. Uh, we all know that Amazon is notoriously exploitative. Um, and Bernie Sanders introduced a piece of legislation called the Stop Bezos Act uh, that was designed to shame Jeff Bezos. Uh, and it would have required the company to pay for the cost of government benefits that its workers received. And the act itself was kind of, it was criticized by the wonks. The wonks looked at the act and they said, well, this piece of legislation doesn't make any sense. It's not going to have, it's not the optimal way to achieve redistribution um, from a technical standpoint. Um, but the act worked. It had the exact effect that Sanders wanted from it, which is that after, after it was announced um, that Amazon was raising its minimum wage to $15 an hour. And so what the wonkish types who looked at what the bill would do if it became law didn't understand is that the act was not supposed to become a law. It was a device for creating a PR headache for Amazon by exposing their low wages by exposing the fact that workers were on food stamps. Now, Amazon has a reputation to preserve. In fact, Amazon is still, I think they're the most trusted brand in the country, right? Because people only look at the customer experience and not the worker experience. Um, so, and they want to preserve that brand. They're very, very dedicated to it. So, you take the thing that the powerful want and you figure out how to fuck with them so that they give you what you want, right? <laughs> And right. so politics, we, we know it doesn't work according to the schoolhouse rock theory, where you introduce a bill, and then there's a polite debate about it, and if you win the argument, then it becomes a law. Politics is a game of power. Um, Nancy Pelosi, for example, she's mocked the Green New Deal and Medicare for All. She said she does not support these things. So you can think, well, we need to persuade Nancy Pelosi that these are good <laughs> ideas. Uh, but you're not going to persuade Nancy Pelosi, because the arguments for these policies are solid, right? The arguments are rock. 
the arguments for not having a burning planet are very, very strong. So it's not, it's not a matter of persuasion. So the way that you get Nancy Pelosi to support things like this is if there is a credible threat to her political career, she does not support them. That's why it's so exciting that DSM, DSA member Shahid Buttar in California is challenging Nancy Pelosi in the primary, even though she's thought to be unbeatable. What he's doing is he's trying to make it so that it is politically costly to stand in the way of progressive policies. So that's why primary challenges by socialists are so important. We are making sure there is a cost to powerful people for not supporting our agenda. It does pay off. Uh, in 2016, because Bernie Sanders came close to winning the presidential primary, he had a lot more influence in the party and everyone had to start trying to sound like him and pretending they believed what he believed. The party, actually the party platform, the Democratic Party platform that Hillary Clinton technically ran on in 2016 is much more radical than it otherwise would have been because at the convention, Sanders had a lot of influence over the platform. Um, the left had proven itself to be organized, so we have to be dealt with, we have to be accommodated. Even when we don't win outright, they have to make concessions. So our work, even when we do not win, is valuable. It pulls people to the left. This is why Heidi Sloan's opponent has to say that she supports Medicare for all. And why, yeah, why every Democratic primary candidate is like, I support Medicare for all for a few people, for some people, for maybe if you want to. Um, so we have to be careful that we are always asking the strategic question. How is what we are doing going to lead to benefits for working people's lives? Uh, Adolf Reed Jr. says the left often lapses into what he calls cargo cult politics. Um, now, the, the phrase cargo cult uh, comes from uh, certain groups of uh, South Pacific Islanders who saw, they saw planes landing on other islands of bringing cargo. This was before they sort of knew what planes were. And they assumed, that this was quite rational and reasonable from their perspective actually, that the cargo came because the planes came because there were airstrips and towers. So they built towers and they built airstrips, um, hoping that, that was the, the, the correlation would, would develop. But no cargo came because planes don't land because you have a thing that looks like an airstrip. Planes land because someone is you know, making a decision to land a plane for a reason. So what Reed, the reason Reed invokes this right, is he says that in politics it can, it can sort of become like this sometimes. When we build a thing that looks like an airstrip and we, we make that assumption, we, if we, we go out and wave signs, we have a protest, it's a very well attended protest, for example, um, because every movement has had protests, but we lack the theory as to, well, who is the protest designed to persuade? <laughs> it, you know, we, we need to have uh, a, a, an idea of where this is going, what kinds of particular pressure are being, uh, are being generated here to move which political actors. Every action we take needs to be based on a theory of what it's supposed to get us, what the path towards victory was. And in fact, you know, previous protest movements have always had it. It's been part of a strategy. Uh, I'm sure many of you have uh, read uh, Jane McAlevey's work, um, it, it, which is very, very useful for starting to get into uh, this uh, ruthless strategic mindset. Uh, she introduces some of the important intellectual concepts that have been developed by labor organizers, like how we understand the actual difference between real organizing and mere mobilizing. That is, building the movement by bringing in new people and uh, just turning out the people we already have. Uh, the majority of people, we have to remember, are, are not yet socialists, or at least they think they're not socialists so, at the moment, um, even though we speak of the necessity of having a mass movement. So it's our job to ask the question, how do we change that? How do we take, pardon me, every person who doesn't agree with us, and how do we change that person's mind? With every initial person we bring on board, we become more powerful, we take another step towards making socialism rather than neoliberal capitalism the dominant political consensus. It's actually kind of funny because the left is often criticized as being the impractical ones, but I think that we think about these questions far more than liberals do. I was, I was on Ezra Klein's podcast recently, <laughs> and his big Sorry. thing, his big, it was painful, uh, <laughs> is, is asking, well, how are you going to get it through the Senate? How are you going to get it through the Senate? You know, oh, you want Medicare for all, you'll never get it through the Senate. And the reason this baffles him so much, how you would ever get it through the Senate, is because he has no understanding of how power works and no understanding of organizing, right? 
So, it, it's, you know, you get it through the Senate, not by sitting down with the senators and going, would you please pass Medicare for all? Would you please believe in it? It's very good. Um, you do it because they're scared. They're scared that they won't have a career anymore if they don't vote for it. This is what Bernie Sanders has promised to do by being an organizer in chief. What he has said is if people do not support the left's agenda, they can expect the President of the United States to show up in their state and campaign for their primary opponent. There is a carrot and a stick. The carrot is that uh, if you support it, the president will love you. He'll invite you to the White House. You'll see, you see how this works, actually, because a lot of powerful people, they just want to stay powerful. So. Um, Andrew Cuomo ended up supporting free college, and Bernie Sanders, you know, no friend of Andrew Cuomo, went to New York and he hugged Andrew Cuomo because Andrew Cuomo had signed on to free college. And then Andrew Cuomo gets to have his picture taken with Bernie Sanders, and he gets to say, hey, pretend that he's on board. What you find is that a lot of the people who, who say, well, you know, the Senate will never come around, they don't understand that people in power oftentimes have no principles. Right? <laughs> they'll vote for Medicare for all, they'll vote for anything if it served their interests, right? If we change where power lies, if we change uh, what the consensus is, uh, if we create public demand for something, if people's constituents are angry with them because they haven't voted for Medicare for all, if it has a cost, they will come around very, very fast. Um, I mean, in fact, in fact, you know, it was interesting. Ezra Klein recently wrote a long endorsement of Elizabeth Warren, and I was reading that endorsement. And it was all about why you know, she knows a lot about policy, all of the things she knows how to do. She's very competent. But the one thing you'll notice is absent from that, and absent from the New York Times' endorsement of Elizabeth Warren, is any role for the public in politics. There's absolutely no discussion whatsoever of where we fit in. You know, what, we just, we're just supposed to elect the smart person, and the smart person goes and fixes the problems. Um, my, my colleague, Luke Savage, has written a, an excellent article on um, why liberals love the West Wing, uh, the TV show, the Aaron Sorkin TV show. And he says that he's got sort of the West Wing theory of politics. And what it is is that on the show The West Wing, what you'll notice is that it's a bunch of smart people who all get into power, Right, and they do. They they strut down hallways, having serious conversations and doing politics. Right? That's what politics is. But you never see the public. They never intrude. They never on the show. Right? It's just it's the West Wing. That is politics. You elect the smart people with the PhDs. More than one thing that Luke notes about the show The West Wing is that over the course of seven seasons, they never accomplish a single significant piece of significant legislation, which is incredible, right? They, they have, you have your, the West Wing is the, the liberal dream. What would we have in our fantasy? And the answer is you'd still get nothing done, even <laughs> in your fantasy. Um, because, that, because it's such a futile view of politics, because you have to, if you want to understand how political change occurs, you have to look at the political changes that have occurred in the past. You have to look at how a social movement works, right? Every single political change in this country that has been valuable has come because there was a social movement pushing to get it done. So if you don't have the social movement, you don't have the political change. Um, and, super important. And I think what the DSA is showing, what the left is showing right now, is that this can work, is that the, the boundaries of political possibility are not what people assume them to be. One of the fascinating things about being at the Atlanta DSA convention is they had all the elected officials, they had about 30 elected officials, DSA officials from around the country. And, you know, contrary to the theory that you know, AOC wins because she's in Queens and it's, it's the left, it's, you know, of course you win in the deep blue areas. The people who the DSA has elected are everywhere. They are in, there was Ruth Buffalo, who was in North Dakota, and who unseated a Republican. Uh, there, you know, there, you have, you know, Mick Pappas is judge in, in Pennsylvania. You have uh, Khalid Kamau in South Fulton, Georgia. Um, you had Franklin Bynum in Houston, which is, Ooh. that's an incredible victory, right? Houston was the capital of capital punishment. It was the epicenter of the death penalty in the United States. You've got a socialist criminal court judge in Houston. I mean, you are proving here in Texas uh, that the red state, blue state dichotomy is a false one because the actual dichotomy is working people versus the owning class. Yep. Yeah, right. But we are in the middle of an experiment right now. I mean, 
you in many ways, as I say, face something incredibly difficult because we don't know how far we can go. We don't know whether this can succeed. Bernie Sanders in 2016, remember, was shocked that he did so well because Bernie Sanders was used to being on the fringes. And he found that he started with 5% in the polls, but that people came on board. People, every single person who heard what he had to say um, came along. And, you know, and it could have, in, in retrospect, he probably could have won that primary. Perhaps if he'd had more confidence at the beginning that he, that he could win it. In fact, that's the way that people who worked on that campaign talk about it now. Um, because we don't know. Um, what we can get done, how far it can go. Uh, and, uh, and this is why it's so exciting to have people trying things like what you're trying here, which is let's forget what people say we can and cannot do. Let us instead ask the question, what must we do, and then figure out how we do it. Um, and that's going to require a lot of experimentation. I think, you know, DSA has very healthy debates over the role of electoral politics, right? And I think it's difficult because electoral politics on the one hand is almost the only game in town in that like, if you can take over the power of the state, you can pass laws, you can enforce those laws, you can introduce policies that require things, you can exert some kind of control. Um, on the other hand, you know, electoral <laughs> politics, if you, is, is limited as well, because, and especially if you put everything into a campaign and you lose. I mean, I was in uh, Michigan doing some reporting on the Abdul al Sayed campaign, and he was not a, a socialist, though he's fairly left and was running on an abolish ICE, Medicare for all platform. Um, and when he lost, it was very, very demoralizing because all of the people who had organized around that one electoral campaign had nowhere to go. They hadn't built a lasting organization. Um, and so they had to go home. And electoral politics, if you don't win, there's a question of what you've gotten. Have you really changed power? Now, I think you can. I think one of the things that the DSA is so great about is using these campaigns as organizing vehicles. And socialists historically have understood that. Right? Eugene Debs, when he ran for president, did not think he was going to be president. It was an opportunity to build the socialist movement, and it worked. Um, and, and so I think that's, that's incredibly powerful, and, and it is, there is a great deal of value in electoral campaigns. But if we put all of our, we are doing something that should be impossible, right? The labor movement is not dead, but it is, uh, it's, on a, it's, it's sort of flat on its back, right? Union, unfortunately, even with the wave of uh, inspiring teacher strikes around the country, uh, union density is lower than ever at the moment. And there is a question about whether without a powerful labor movement, you can, in fact, uh, enact political change, right? We are trying to do something that is untested and kind of impossible. The Bernie Sanders campaign is fantastic, um, but without a labor movement behind you, can you get things done? I'm not sure. Do we have to build unions first, or can we do it afterwards? These are untested questions. We don't know the answer. People are trying things all around the country. I, um, you know, and I love watching people in companies around the United States and the, and the world um, who even without a labor, even without a real labor movement to plug into, are beginning to unionize. We, um, Current Affairs had a campaign on Kickstarter recently, and it was interesting because Kickstarter, in the middle of the time we were having our campaign, uh, was trying to unionize. And the company tried to crush the, the union, of course, even though they uh, call themselves a, uh, a, a triple bottom line company that cares about stakeholders, uh, which is always a sign that if a union crops up, they will do everything they can to bust it. Um, but what we did with the Kickstarter campaign was um, we brought in all the Kickstarter creators, the people who had projects on Kickstarter. Uh, because a lot of them are, have left sympathies, a lot of them are workers themselves. And we had hundreds of them representing, I think, $50 million worth of projects who all signed a petition to the company saying, you better recognize this union. They have not yet recognized the union, but what we realized was that having the creators come together, the Kickstarter creators, was a significant source of power because all of Kickstarter's revenue comes from taking a cut 
of people's projects. So if the project creators leave, if they go to Indiegogo or GoFundMe, um, Kickstarter really struggles. So you have to think about those points. And we've really helped um, through that campaign. We've really helped their union uh, get a significant source of leverage because they, the company now knows that if they're too anti-union, um, people, project creators will balk, they will go. These are things we have to experiment with, right? Uh, these are things that we don't know if they're going to work, um, but we're trying everything we can. Now, one, one thing that I love about DSA is the diversity of tactics, right? Different, different ways of approaching politics in different places. Yes, you have congressional campaigns. Yes, you have Heidi Sloan's fantastic campaign here, but you also have, you know, in, in New, you know, New Orleans started doing the brake light clinics, which is a, a fantastic innovation where, you know, in New Orleans, I've talked to people there who say, well, we, we really don't think a congressional campaign could get very far here. I don't know whether that's true, but I think, I think, I understand that when people feel completely shut out, Louisiana politics is very difficult to break into. You have to think, you know, what else can we do? What different ways can we approach politics? In Chicago, it was aldermanic racism. That really, really worked well, and now they've got a bunch of people on the city board of aldermen. Um, so you have different, different political opportunities in different places, and the great thing about DSA being a federated organization is that you do have the ability to have each, each chapter be a sort of laboratory of democracy. Um, so experimentation, diversity of tactics is one thing that I think is important. I, I do want to go back to the clarity of vision, though, because I, I've been talking a lot about how you be, uh, how you think about what to do as a socialist. Uh, but I think it is important not to lose sight of the things that we, in fact, stand for. One of the reasons that I you know, wrote why you should be a socialist is not just to convert people who, already, who are not socialists, but for people who are already socialists, like us, uh, to get us to think, well, you know, what, what is our ideal world truly look like, right? What, is, what, is, what does it mean? I, I talk a lot about utopias in the book and about thinking about what, the, what our ideal would really be like if we managed to get everything we wanted, what kind of world we really are fighting for. Uh, the, both, the, both the bread and the roses, what that looks like. I am wearing a gigantic flower today uh, because I take the, the roses part of bread and roses so seriously. Um, that is to say, right, we talk a lot about the need for people to have housing and health care, but we want them to have beautiful things. We want them to have culture as well. We want people to have access to everything that is good about life. Not just to be fed, but to be fed with the best food. Not just to have public housing, but to have beautiful public housing that is a joy to be in. Not just to have health care, but to feel taken care of. To feel part of a community. And I think it is worth having those discussions about you know, what, what it means to be a socialist. I start from... When I ask myself, what does it mean to be a socialist, I start with that, that wonderful, that sort of beautiful word that makes me cry nearly every time I hear it, solidarity. And I think back to the real meaning of Eugene Debs' quote, while there is a lower class, I am in it, and while there is a soul in prison, I am not free. Which we've all heard a bunch, but when you take it seriously, when you think about what that really, really means, it's very, very powerful. While there is a single soul, in prison. That is to say, well, uh, until we have full prison abolition, my own freedom is not complete. And that is the sentiment that Bernie Sanders was echoing when he talked about fighting for people who do not share your own problems. That is such a central part of what socialism is about. You know, empathy is a very weak sounding word, but it really is looking at every other person, trying to see things from their perspective and saying, I'm with you. You know, when I was in Atlanta, Sarah Nelson gave this incredible, incredible speech, some of you may have seen, and it ended with her saying that the fundamental principle is, I've got your back. And everybody saying that to each other. Everybody looking at other people's problems and saying, I care even though I don't experience them myself. And not only that, but I do not feel as if I have full freedom until you do. Um, I think one other thing that being a socialist requires in our daily -day lives is making sure that we are asking ourselves the right questions because there are so many <laughs> difficult questions that we face that don't have obvious or easy answers. We might know what socialism requires of us politically, but what does it require of us as people in our behavior towards one another? Is there a socialistic ethic? You know, what, is it, what does it mean as a socialist to be a friend, what does it mean to be a neighbor, what does it mean to be a person, how, how do we relate to other people, what do we owe one another, how much 
should we sacrifice? How much uh, is, it, is there an obligation to give up ourselves? That's a difficult question. I don't think the answer is obvious. I really don't. What lines, another difficult question, what lines do you have to draw when you are thinking about bringing people into the movement? There's been this controversy in the last few days over uh, uh, Bernie Sanders uh, being endorsed by Joe Rogan, right? And I think that is an interesting case of this because both sides have a, a point, right? Because on the one hand, we have to, one of our principles as, as socialists is you take people as they are, you believe that people can learn and grow. Everyone has, everyone has things that they've said that are bad, and we try and encourage people. We want to bring people in rather than alienate them. We want to bring, we want everyone to ultimately agree with us. It's great when people who don't share our politics end up supporting uh, our political agenda. On the other hand, we have an absolute prohibition on transphobia and racism. We take those things very seriously, right? And we don't want. Uh, and we take the comfort and safety of people in the movement very seriously. And so how do you balance the need to work with all people, the need to bring in people who are, have problems, who are you know, messed up, who are problematic? How do you, how do you balance that? Because if, we're, if we are a movement that speaks to all people, we're gonna have to do that with a movement that sets clear lines and that doesn't compromise its core values against, uh, and against bigotry, against transphobia, against racism. Those things are difficult. And I think it's good that we're having uh, that, that kind of conversation. Another important question socialists have to ask, how are we going to become internationalists? How are we going to make our fight for health justice in the United States and the Iraqi people's struggle against imperialism part of the same fight? That's a very, very difficult question. I think the DSA, uh, we're really at the beginning of figuring out how to do this. Ultimately, we shouldn't be the democratic socialists of America, right? We should be the democratic socialists of the world, right? The, the slogan of socialism has always been, workers of the world unite. How do we make sure that we aren't just serving the people in the wealthiest country in the world and we have a true international movement? So asking these really, really difficult questions of being open to different answers and having vibrant discussions, which is one of the things the DSA is so good at. Um, the last thing that I would suggest is that we really just truly believe in ourselves in this, inc in this incredible political moment. I think it's, keep, we, it's worth continuously coming back to just how incredible uh, what Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez did in New York was, right? What she proved is that many things that were said about politics were a lie, which is to say the idea that you couldn't, you couldn't win. You can't win if you're a 29-year-old bartender who has one-tenth of the money and you're going against an incumbent who has been in power for 10 terms and who is hugely influential in the Democratic Party. That turned out to be false. It turns out that you can win. And she proved it. And because she proved it, it forces us to wonder what else might be possible that we don't realize is possible. What else are we not doing because we just don't believe that we can do it? We really have just such an opportunity at the moment. American politics is changing. A window is opening. The democratic establishment is weak. They know, a lot of people know that the arguments for capitalism are failing, right? They sense it because the planetary emergency, right? You know, uh, climate catastrophe just proves, I mean, it proves the case. It's, it really is a, a socialism or barbarism and it's increasingly obvious to people that nobody has a plausible solution to climate change except the left. This, well, this could well be our year. If we speak at this time next year, we could be living in a very, very different political world. But it will only be our year if we make it so, if we really, if we really, really act. Polls, Bernie Sanders has been moving up in the polls. There's a poll today showing Bernie Sanders winning Iowa by, by not a small margin. Woo! <laughs> He's sitting at 25%, no one else is breaking 20. Right. But why did those polls move? Why has Bernie been going up? He's been going up because there are thousands and thousands of people around Iowa every single day, taking every single person they could find, speaking to those people and trying to persuade them, doing everything they can, putting all of their energy into getting that person to vote, to commit to vote for Bernie Sanders. Right? The polls move because people are making the move. So, just to conclude here, to sum up these, the, 
points that I think of when I think of this question, what does it mean to be a socialist? How do we figure out how to act? Well, first, you know, in, in building a movement, we have to all try and get along and understand one another, be compassionate towards one another, but without compromising our principles. That's incredibly difficult, but DSA is providing a great example. We have to study those who came before us, look at what they did, understand ourselves as continuing that work, learn the lessons from what they succeeded and failed at. We have to think strategically, avoid cargo cult politics, look at how power is transferred from one group of people to another and how we can get it. Treat this as an experiment, understand that a lot is unproven, that we don't know what works and what doesn't, that we have to look at other people on the left who are succeeding and do what they do and learn from them. We have to maintain that clarity of vision, that understanding of what it really means to have both bread and roses, the real meaning of the word solidarity. We've got to constantly remind ourselves exactly what it is we are fighting for in very concrete terms and to envision that world we want. We need to make sure the right questions are being asked, that we're not neglecting something important, and we need to seize the moment and we need to believe in ourselves. Now, one thing that is notable about the history of socialism is that it is a history of socialists being right about things. <laughs> when Eugene Debs was thrown into prison for resisting World War I, he was right. When the new left in the 60s called the Vietnam War a monstrous atrocity, and when the left in 2003 denounced the Iraq War, they were right. The IWW was right. Helen Keller and Martin Luther King were right. The DSA has been right. Bernie Sanders has been right. They haven't always won, but history looks favorably on the socialists. In every generation for more than a century, you have had socialists being the ones to point out intolerable injustices in society and refusing to accept them. You know, the scaremongering about the civil rights movement was that it was full of communists. But in fact, that was partly true, right? It was sort of full of communists because it has always been the radical left who have been the most dedicated to and the most present in the struggle against oppression. I think the DSA right now, and I don't mean this is flattery, I mean this is fact, is the most, the single most important organization in this country right now. It is the only organization that has a powerful, unifying vision of how we can incorporate simultaneously the struggles for economic justice, racial justice, immigrant justice, environmental justice, gender justice, disability justice, and health justice. No one else comes close. The people in the DSA, some of the most kind and committed people I have ever met. This organization has the power to change the world. It has already helped change American politics completely. You can see that from the fact that a democratic socialist is currently leading the democratic primary. That is unprecedented. So this question, the question of why you should be a socialist, that's easily answered. We all know the answers to that. The question of how to be a socialist is going to be much, much harder. But all across the country, DSA chapters are coming up with very, very good answers. And we're going to figure it out. It's essential that we do because the stakes are so high. And I, I really think we can because ultimately we are radicals in that we depart so strongly from the political mainstream um, and the neoliberal consensus. But we are not radicals in that we have a vision that can appeal strongly to people all across the world. Socialist values are human values. They are the values of solidarity and freedom. We envision a world where people are not tyrannized over at their jobs, where they do not have to worry if they can afford to stay alive or keep a roof over their heads, where the natural world is cared for, where there is a vibrant commons, good public libraries, good free public schools, good free public colleges, good free public transit. We envision an end to the feudalism of billionaire rule, where who gets help depends on whatever Bill Gates is feeling favorably disposed to on any given morning, rather than a democratic process. Socialists have an exciting and a beautiful vision of a much better world, and you are the people who are bringing it about. It is not going to be easy, and I know that there is no harder question than the question of what to do next. But we have the people, compassionate, brilliant people, all of you, and we are in a moment of great possibility. So congratulations on all that you have done so far, and good luck to you in all that you are going to do in the very near future. Solidarity forever, and thank you.